Thank you. All right, I think I have. Yeah, sounds like I've got the mic. Um, and uh, so there we are, going to the, uh, that's who we are. And then, all right, this is different than my normal disclaimer. My normal disclaimer is uh, I-A-A-L, but I-A-N-Y-L. And this, of course, is modified for <laughs> we. <laughs> So just the, we, we, this is not legal advice. We are lawyers, but this is not legal advice. Don't rely on it. Legal situations are very fact specific and location specific and all of that. So these are general principles, general ideas, things like that, but don't rely upon it. You know, get some, if you really need advice in this area, talk to somebody and, and get it specific for your situation. So enough of a disclaimer. <laughs> So I'm just going to run through some of the basics of IP law. I'm not going to assume that, that you know a lot, um, but I am just going to skim the surface very lightly to give you an idea of the, the, basic, um, uh, the basic pieces of intellectual property that uh, people care about for the most part. Um, I'm probably going to leave out trademarks. It's not on the list. Those are also important, but don't come up as much. Um, we, we could go into all kinds of, you know, have a whole separate thing on um, trademarks like the Linux and, and Tux and, you know, all, all those wonderful fun things, but nah, not, not this talk. So pretty much um, what I'm going to cover are copyrights, patents, trade secrets. Um, copyrights are kind of the most fun. Uh, they cover uh, anything that is um, uh, put into a, a, a tangible medium when it's when it's written down. It's a creative, uh, or you know, not necessarily terribly creative thing, but um, copyrights just happen. You know, the bumper sticker that says "stuff happens" in the clean version. Well, copyrights just happen. They they happen every time you write something down. Every time you hit save on your computer, the copyright exists. You don't have to register it for the copyright to exist. And outside the US, you typically don't have to register it at all. Inside the US, you do have to register it in order to sue someone about it. And you, there are other benefits to, to registering it if you, if you want to. If, you in, if it's important enough that you're basing your company on it, if it's important enough that you want to be able to sue someone in the future if, if they're infringing it, then you might want to register it. But in general, the copyright exists without registration. In the US, you just can't go to court over it without registering it. So that's, that's the difference. Um, the length of a copyright is the life of the author plus, and I always get this wrong, 70 years, because they keep increasing it. Um, so anybody you can think of who is an author, an author is creator. So it can be the artist who painted something, um, the composer who made the music, uh, the author who wrote something, that, you know, whatever it is. Uh, it's life of the author plus 70 years. If it's a company, if it's anonymous or pseud pseudonymous, 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 thank you. Never had to say that one out loud. Um, pseudonymous. Then, um, which would be an interesting discussion in and of itself in the technical community. You know, when, when is it really being done under a pseudonym and when isn't it? Um, but then uh, it has a uh, 120, the shorter of 95 years from publication, which is another huge conversation about what really is publication, because it's not what you think it is. Um, or 100 years, uh, no, 120 years from, they keep extending them, 120 years from creation. So in general, they looked at this and said, okay, what is somebody's life? And then tack it on to get roughly the, the life plus 70 um, of, uh, of when the author's a real person. Um, what else did I want to talk about? Um, the, the main thing with copyright to remember is that you are protecting the actual expression of the idea, of the creative thing. You're not protecting the idea, concept, um, tableau, uh, you know, 
anything intangible in that sense. What you are protecting is literally what you write down, possibly with small variations. You can still find an infringement if somebody takes exactly your thing and just changes a word here or there. You might well be able to find infringement in that, case, in that situation. But in general, it's not protecting your ideas, concepts. The, you can take a photograph of Mount Hood. I'm facing the wrong direction, but you get the idea. You could take a photograph of Mount Hood. The person standing next to you could take a photograph of Mount Hood. They're, the photos are going to look pretty much identical. You have separate copyright. It's a very thin copyright because the third person down is also going to take a picture that's going to look the same, and they're going to have their own separate copyright, and you can't sue each other. You know, that, that's just how, how thin it is. But your literal picture is protected. Um, so was that a question? Or? Oh, OK. <laughs> um, the next thing is uh, patents. So patents typically go to inventions as opposed to expressions. Um, software can be covered under both. Software can be covered by copyright. Software is definitely copy covered by copyright. Um, there are fights. There are countries where uh, software is not covered by patents. Software is covered by patents in the US, in many other places. But so it, it, it's a tougher test, one would hope. Not always the case, because we've all heard stories about horrible software patents. But um, there, there is a process. A copyright, there's very little process done when you register it to say, is this unique? You know, is this actually something that deserves copyright? If you're willing to pay the, and I think it starts as low as 30 or $35 these days, to register a copyright, if you're willing to pay that, they usually don't look very closely. Um, there are a few things that blur the line that they'll say, this doesn't qualify. There is nothing creative in here, or it's not the type of thing. This should be a trademark. This should be a, you know, a patent. This should be something else. Occasionally, they'll reject. Um, but in a patent, they do examine it. Um, patents are expensive to get, probably not expensive enough, um, again, because of all the ones that go through. But um, they are, let's see, um, process, machine, uh, manufacture, or composition of matter. And process is, is typically um, the way you discuss software, um, although it, there are arguments in there. The, the thing about patents is they're supposed to be new, useful, non-obvious, and disclosed in the application. The trade-off, the idea of a patent or a copyright giving a monopoly for a period of time, so you can stop anybody from doing what's, what's in your patent, um, the, the, the trade-off for the monopoly is that it is disclosed, and when your patent expires, anybody can do that. So in the software world, kind of silly, lasts for 20 years. There is some software from 20 years ago that is still out there. So if it had been patented, it would now be public domain, and, you know, open and available for, for people to use. But the idea is for most things, 20 years is a pretty good period of protection. Uh, you'll hear the pharmaceutical people argue otherwise, you know, the certain other things that may have better reason for being protected. Um, but uh, the, the 20 years, um, and then it's open. And to be clear, uh, the 20-year-old software that's still running today, whatever, the, the patent would be freely available. The code itself would still be under copyright, correct? Um, yeah, there are, uh, yes, if, you know, yeah. Um, there, there are fights in the patent versus copyright area. If you can get a patent on it, you might not be able to get a copyright on it. But again, the exact expression versus, because you're not supposed to be able to copyright something that's functional, and you're only supposed to be able to patent something that's functional. I haven't seen that argument in copyright yet. It's happened in other places. Yeah, silly cases. But um, you are right that the, the, the patent protects the, the concept. And so the concept may now be open that you could write to that same concept. But the literal code 
may still be copyrighted. But again, I actually, that's a good point because I haven't actually seen that fight yet. Um, I'm sure it's going to happen, but um, we didn't have the patents that we have, uh, have aren't that old yet, so we don't have any expired ones. But I mean, one of the gifts was a patent, wasn't it? Sure. Yeah, that expired uh, a few years mm -hmm. ago. Yeah. yeah. So, but I got enough to have any running code. Yeah. Quick, 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 fast, quick <laughs> question. Is, yes. Is it, um, software is not patentable in some countries. Could mm -hmm. you? Give some examples. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely. Um, I don't keep a running list in my head. Are they like um, Western European or are they like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hunters? It's it's not just places that you wouldn't care about. Um, I, <laughs> I I have to remember. I I think either Australia or New Zealand, possibly both, but at least one of those. And and Europe's been fighting over it both ways. And I don't know who's ended up where at this point. Um, but Europe has been more resistant to it, um, so I don't think, at least, um, I'm pretty sure it's not widespread. Um, and as I said, I think either Australia or New Zealand recently said, are you joking? Um, so, you know, there, there are significant economies in the world who do not have software patents, but I don't keep a list in my head, I'm sorry. Um, uh, so I think that's... That's pretty much what we needed on the patent side. Trade secret, you know, the, the classic example of trade secret is the recipe for Coke. It's something that is kept secret and it has economic value by staying secret. Um, if you patented it, like I said, for that period of monopoly, the trade-off is that you have to make it public. You have to disclose it. So Coke over the years has says, no, we won't. We're going to keep it as a trade secret. But trade secrets, the way people usually think of them is that the really valuable ones um, are things that might be patentable in, in the general sense. They might not quite be unique enough or, or something like that. There are also things like customer lists and, you know, and other confidential information. And the classic way to protect a trade secret is with an NDA. Um, part, of the, part of the way you protect your trade secret is to keep it secret. You have to actually try. If you post it on your website, you can't later claim that it's a trade secret, um, which is why NDAs are all over the place. It's because that's the classic way of saying, I think this is confidential. I'm letting you see it, but that doesn't mean you get to use it for anything other than what we're talking about. Um, so that's, those, are, those are the basics um, of, of that. What I wanted to uh, move into before we get to the interesting stuff is, um, what you can expect to see in an agreement with an employer. What do employers care about when they're um, looking to hire you and looking to protect their own rights? And what is the default rule? Now, this is by necessity default rule in the US. Um, it, it does even get state specific to a certain extent on some of these things. But for copyrights and patents, again, for the most part, it's federal. Um, there, are, there are some state rules about employee responsibility to turn over your invention to your employer, blah, 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 blah. But in general, these are the rules that will apply in the US. So the default, when you start to work as an employee of a company, is that the company will own whatever is copyrighted, copyrightable, uh, copyrighted, when you make it as, as an employee to the point where the company is the author. You are the finger uh, or the hand of the company that is the author. So you, you don't even have to be acknowledged. You don't exist in that sense. You, you are just an instrumentality of the company. So the copyright, the, the, the company is the author. That's the default. Um, the default for inventions is the opposite. You I own it. Can I ask for a clarification? Yeah. The, the default is they own what you create while you're working for the company, or is it anything you do? This is Read part. Contracts yeah, this is part of the debate because I think um, I, I, everyone's assumption is for the default for this work made for hire rule 
is that, yeah, it's, and, and I look at my work made for hire expert, that, that it is what you do for the company. Um, the Copyright Act says that, um, or the way that copyright law has been interpreted is that the, the company, the person who's the author for Work Made for Hire actually has to do the directing. You have to be acting under their supervision, you have to be acting at their direction. It can't be, um, or it shouldn't be, uh, that you do something all on your own, but because you're under their, um, you know, this umbrella, they, they get to keep it. However, contract law and what you agree to can change that default, which is why it's really important to read your contracts and understand how your company is deciding to define work for hire. So that, that, is, the, that is the big ambiguity in, in a lot of these contracts. But yes, if you have no written contract relating to IP, you're just working for somebody, then yeah, it has to be what you're doing for your job for the company and they're saying you need to write this manual or this memo or whatever or this software to, you know, for us. Um, for inventions, um, I, I say the default is, is the opposite, but it, it's a little more complicated than that. In general, if you invent something, you own it. If you were hired to invent, <laughs> which gets very messy, then the company might own it. At a minimum, if you did it as part of your job, the company will have a right to use it. It's called a shop right. Um, but you might still own it. You are definitely the inventor. So the human beings involved are the ones that have to be named in the patent if a patent is filed. Your company name will be there as, you know, the owner of the patent, but you're still the inventor. You don't disappear in the same way you do um, with a copyright. So there are times when the company will own it automatically, but in general the default is, in the absence of a written agreement, if you are an employee, the company owns your copyrights and you own your inventions. Now, Every technology company will have you sign an agreement. Um, Non-technology companies are having you sign agreements these days. Um, you techno you know, companies are having people who are not technology, you know, they're having the, the receptionist sign the same agreement that the engineer you know, is. Um, overkill, but it is happening. And what they will typically say is, and, and here's where the ambiguous language comes in, and we're going to focus on some that's, that's ambiguous. But and it, it, what they should say is anything you, you do for us that's copyrighted, we own because it's a work for hire, you know, it's under the copyright law the way it is. And if by chance it's not, you're going to assign it to us anyway. In fact, you automatically assign it to us anyway. That's, that's the catch-all. If they write it poorly, they may capture more than they're supposed to. Most, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, to be honest, I have, um, I have only heard stories about employers who've done it on purpose. Um, it would not surprise me if some of those stories were true. But with everyone I've worked with, Silicon Valley and up in Oregon, I have never seen anyone do it on purpose when he, I, because if they told me that was what they wanted to do, I might walk away, you know. Um, so maybe they just know better. But, you know, it, it's, I have never seen, I've never been directly involved with somebody doing it on purpose. Um, on the pat, it's even more so, it's more questionable on the patent side um, because they are more sensitive about the tinkerer in the garage. Um, and there, there are some state laws California and, Oregon, uh, California and Washington both have state laws um, that limit what a company can claim for inventions. Um, it's kind of logical, at least to me. Maybe I've been around it too long, but you did it for the company. It was part of your job. Okay, that one's okay. You used the facilities or the, the you know, equipment or the resources of the company to do it. That one could get fuzzy because we all have our laptops that are company 
laptops or phones or uh oh and you know it's lunchtime but we're using the company Wi-Fi um, eh, okay it gets messy um, or and this is the really messy one it, it relates to the actual or demonstrably anticipated uh, research and you know development activities of the company so it's what we're about to do um, and uh, this is these, um, as I said, Oregon and uh, Oregon does not have a state law. And this is one I have definitely heard stories about companies trying to reach completely unrelated inventions of their employees because something got hot, even though it was not related to what the company was doing. So I've heard the rumors, but I, you know, at this point, they're still only rumors. However, people get nervous, and every once in a while, in fact, almost every legislative session in the past 10 years, somebody's tried to bring up a law in Oregon to look like the, the Washington and California ones to just put those in place. Almost every company I know uses that language anyway. They've all stolen it from Silicon Valley companies or you know somebody. So most of the Oregon companies I know, I haven't looked at one from like Intel or Nike or somebody really big lately. Um, but most of the companies I know in Oregon use the same language that California and Washington use anyway. So it's kind of the, what's generally considered the norm. It has to be related to the company or using their resources. Um, but this is where the language um, gets ambiguous. So um, that's, that's the, the baseline. Turn over to Katie to talk about uh, negotiation. Um, these are, I, I can real, real briefly, I'd gone on long enough, I figured I should uh, back off. Yeah, I'd gone on long enough. Um, there are other things, oh, actually, the most important one I want to list, see, it is important to look at my notes once in a while, no matter how many times I've done this. Um, one of the things you will typically see in an employment agreement is something that says, um, I've attached a list of all my past inventions, and if I don't list anything, then I don't have anything. Mm. And you don't ever want to not list things. This is, should be from, if you haven't done it yet, start it, a list of significant projects, things you work on. It's the same as your CV that you would use. You know, normally you would attach this to your, your resume anyway, especially for open source projects. Talk about what you're involved in, what you've done, if you've invented things in the past. There may be confidentiality reasons you can't go into too much detail if it's something you created for another company. Um, so you might just have to say something like, you know, uh, if you're an inventor in a patent, that's really easy. Um, you just list the patent because that once it's, um, at least once it's been granted, it's public. Whether it's public before then is, uh, is a question. Um, but you can talk about the, you know, the products of such and such company, you know, at least mention that. It's less important to, to identify previous employers because you're, you're not, at least you better not, um, be taking any of that code or, or IP with you to use at the new company. But for outside projects, for your own stuff, definitely for any third party projects um, that, that you, you know, um, uh, if you've committed code, if you, you know, work on these projects, list them. It's just a good thing to have. It's your CV. It's what you, you show. See, I do stuff. Um, but it's also the thing you want to attach. And you say, I'm involved or have been at some time involved in all this. That also makes the conversations we're going to talk about a lot easier. Because you've disclosed this. It's known to your employer. They may freak out. You can deal with the freak out stuff. But you know, this, this is the stuff that, that needs to be public. This is why I talk about doing these things in sunlight, being public about what you do. Um, other things that may show up um, in, in these agreements are not as objectionable typically. You know, confidentiality. We were talked about trade secrets. The company needs you to keep stuff confid confidential. There may be things about non-solicits. You can't take uh, customers with you or you can't uh, try and bring other employees with you. There have to be limits on that, but, you know, it varies um, as to what's reasonable. Um, there may be a loyalty clause, a no moonlighting clause. So that's one you have to keep an eye out for because you may need to negotiate that. Um, Non-competes. Oregon has very specific rules. California says, I don't think so. California does not do non-competes at all. And gee, 
their industry has suffered so much by that. Um, <laughs> but, but pretty much everywhere else in the states, they are legal under certain restrictions. Um, Oregon allows them. There's just some very specific um, rule, hoops that have to be jumped through and limitations. And if they want, if they fire you and want to keep you under the non-compete, they have to pay you. It's kind of cool. Um, at least that's the way the rules were when they were first drafted. I don't really pay attention to the non-compete rules, but um, there, there are some nice things about um, the Oregon one. Uh, other things to ask about, social media policies, especially if you're going to be doing social media for the company. What, do you, what about your personal social media? Do you have to identify yourself or at least refrain from making any comments about work? Um, you know, these are not my employer's opinions, things like that if you talk about work. How sensitive are they? Can you educate them a little if they're oversensitive? Um, and uh, obviously, if they are, um, and what do they know about open source? Um, if they already have a policy, if they're friendly to it, you know, some of, some of the considerations. The language in the agreements may not be any different, so you may have to, you know, raise their consciousness a little as to what, you know, what they're doing on one hand versus what their agreements say on the other. Um, but those are things that may come up that, that are, are less relevant but can also really impact uh, the work you do. Just again saying, read these agreements before you sign them. Think about how they apply to you and the company and the work you want to do both in the company and outside. Um, thank you. Yeah. So now Katie will talk about negotiation. I love negotiation. I think it's fun. Uh, but a lot of people don't. A lot of people think it is about winning or losing and that there is a real risk that if you approach your employer, if you approach somebody and say, hey, I would really like to do this thing, that what you're risking is hearing no uh, or you're risking the fact that, that they might m take that away from you. So one of the things that we wanted to make clear is that it is easier at the beginning if you're upfront about the fact that you want to do side projects or that you have freelance um, than it is later on. Because if they find out about it later on, that negotiation is much more difficult because you are all of a sudden talking about trust and honesty and I, I, you weren't upfront with me, which isn't necessarily true. They could totally trust you and maybe you just didn't talk about it because you didn't want to talk about it. Um, but you introduce a lot more emotion in that later negotiation than you have at the very beginning. Um, there are two basic ways that people negotiate. Um, one is position-based negotiation and the other is interest-based negotiation. Position-based no negotiation is what everybody's familiar with, which is you have that thing, I want that thing, we're going to argue over it until we have divided it up so many ways that neither one of us wants that thing, um, but one of us wins. Yay! Uh, whereas interest-based negotiation is talking about your interests, why you want what you want. So one of the ways I usually describe this is silly, but stick with me. Um, if for whatever reason my wife and I decided we needed more animals in the house and we were negotiating over what the new pet was, if I was approaching it from a positional point of view, I would say, I want a French bulldog. The problem with that is all I've done is I've, I've now made the negotiation about a yes or a no. Either yes, French bulldog, or no, French bulldog. That, that, that's all. That's all I can do in that area. Whereas, if I talk about my interests, if I say, well, I'd, I would really like uh, a pet that is easy to take care of, kind of small, makes a lot of noise, mostly cuddly, kind of loyal, but not totally, I've now described what I want a potential solution to look like, and I can now work with her to come up with lots of different types of pets or animals that could fulfill that need. And she might be able to come up with one that fulfills my interests even better than a French bulldog might, just because I hadn't thought of it. So it's a silly way of thinking about it, but it's relatively easy to remember that I just talked to you about the next pet I'm going to have. Um, so when, when you approach a negotiation at work from an interest-based philosophy, particularly when we're talking about um, working on other, other projects and, and open source stuff, is um, thinking about what it is that your employer is most interested in. Uh, what 
do they want to see in their employees? What are some of the projects that they're working on? What, it, what is the, the image that they are portraying to the outside world? What are the things that they're telling other people they're really proud that they do and that they do well? And then being able to, before you even talk, up, talk to them, go back and looking at the work that you're doing or that you want to do and being able to identify how that work could support their interests. So instead of now approaching them and saying, hey, I'd like to do this thing it might sound a little bit wonky to you and you're probably going to get really nervous about it and I'm going to have to teach you what open source is, you can approach them and say, hey, I have this opportunity to work on a project that's going to be able to give me skills that are going to be di directly applicable to the job that we have coming up in the next three months. I'm going to be able to network with a lot of uh, other professionals in the area and sort of expand uh, my reach, let other people know the kind of professionals that our company has. Um, and you don't have to pay me to do it because I can do it all on my own time. Are you cool with that? That is a much better conversation than the, hey, I would like to do this thing. Can I do this thing? So um, as you might guess, with interest-based negotiation, you have to do a lot more planning than you would with positional. But it's planning that can be really helpful because once you get into that conversation, you now have this, this backlog of knowledge and information of, OK, if they come to me with this concern, I've already thought about that. And I can talk to them about this particular interest. The other thing um, that is great about interest-based negotiation is that it's really good for curious people. So if you like uh, solving problems or being curious, which I'm sure nobody in this room is at all, um, it's, it's the perfect type of negotiation to engage in. Because when you hit, when you hit a, a, a roadblock, the first thing that you should do is start asking questions. So instead of taking a no or a that's not going to work um, at face value and then just stopping, what you can do is start asking questions. You seem resistant to this. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about what's bothering you? Um, if we were able to structure it so that I was only doing it on the, on the weekends, which is obviously not time, do you think that might work out a little bit better for you? Um, is it the fact that I'm working on open source stuff? Or is it the fact that um, we have this big project coming up that's most concerning to you? Like, are you worried that I'm going to take something that we're doing here and use it there? Or are you worried that I'm going to bring something in that makes you uncomfortable? So by asking questions, you get to understand their interests better. And it means that you don't have to stop when, they, when there's a no. Um, the frustrating thing can be is that you have to be a bit more patient. Sometimes it takes longer for those problems to um, work themselves out. It might not be that initial conversation that gets you exactly what you want, but you can start establishing an understanding and an expectation. Um, I, I know at our work we have we have like one-on-ones and group meetings and that sort of thing. So if I'm really interested in us going in a particular direction. I start talking about the good qualities and how they're connected to some of the qualities that our company shares. Like, you know, I heard about this thing the other day, uh, and it sounds really cool. It sounds a lot like what we're trying to do in XYZ. And that way you're, you're, you're working towards your goal, but you're, you're banking that um, trust and you're, you're educating your employer even before you get to that conversation. Um, so I would encourage you to, uh, one, think about your interests and think about theirs. Ask questions from your employer. Um, if you get pushback, uh, don't just accept a no. Be really curious about what is motivating them and try to see if you can uncover uh, possible solutions. Um, invite them to be problem solvers with you. Sometimes that can turn a, a confrontational negotiation into a much more collaborative process. Um, and one of the things I tell uh, my clients is that I can always be the bad guy. As the lawyer, you can always say that I don't understand, and oh my gosh, I'm so unreasonable, and geez, she's hard to talk to. So that my client can have a collaborative relationship with the person that they're negotiating with. Um, and so y you can kind of do that too. You can make the fact that you're both interested in serving these interests and say, hey, I think that this could be really good for both of us. Would you help me brainstorm some ideas in which we might be able to do it? Um, and so 
uh, with that in mind, we wanted to talk through a couple hypotheticals because there are a couple different ways that this can come up, right? Um, and oftentimes, uh, you're going to start with an em an employment agreement. And that employment agreement is going to have very specific language about what you can do and what you can't do. And it can be confusing um, because as we talked about, sometimes it's very intentional that it's Ambiguous, amb ambiguous. Um, other times, it's just the fact that it's poorly drafted. And that's something that I hope you remember about all contracts. Just because it's in the contract doesn't mean it's true or right. It's OK to push back and ask questions about them. Sometimes people just get things wrong. They're human. And sometimes lawyers, with very, very good intentions, don't totally understand their client's business and so, or are not completely familiar with that area of law. And so they find a clause that has worked in the past and they stick it in the new contract. And unless the client comes back and says, we totally don't like that, it's gonna stay in the contract. And shockingly, not everybody reads the contract that their lawyer spent a lot of time preparing for them and that they paid a lot of money for. Shockingly, sometimes they're just happy that it's over. Um, and that they can send it to somebody else now and get it signed. So if you, if you see that kind of language, one of the things I, I hope you take away is that it's perfectly okay to question it and, and, and do a little bit of pushback. So you want to set, set up the hypo? All right. It's sort of, now I'm kind of, I'm kind of embarrassed about all this. But, um, <laughs> Uh, I was just thinking about this, trying to come up with uh, a situation, and of course, as everything else, it came to me in the shower. Um, but I, I was just thinking, what what could be? Uh, we were talking about app using an app situation because you know, obviously, that's that's hot in in certain areas, but but also um, can eventually move its way into the the enterprise um, field as well. So I was thinking, well, what would, what would somebody be doing that they could get so excited about that would not be a threat? Um, and I, I just came up with this idea because I actually think it would be cool. I like it. Yeah, which is kind of like ways for bicycles here in Portland, kind of as a civic apps project, um, which people outside Portland may not be familiar with, but basically it's um, all the public data about things like the ones I was thinking of was besides uh, bike lanes and you know established bike lanes and things like that, but construction projects, paving projects, things like that. These things, um, I'm not positive about paving projects, but a lot of the public data, uh, the data that the city collects or has is made public and is available for people to make apps out of in, in Portland. Um, and there, there have been some great ones. Um, oh, uh, no, I'm not remembering any of them, but there are a lot of, if you're, if you're from Portland or if, you're, if you visit often, there are quite a few that use the TriMet, mm -hmm. the, the buses and the, and the trains, the data from that. So there, there are a lot of uh, different apps that, that use the same data. Um, so I was thinking, use some of that um, for bicycles, but also have kind of the Waze, if everyone knows what, what Waze is, um, for, for cars, just got bought by who, Google, I mm -hmm. think? and um, have uh, cyclists be able to contribute data in real time. Oh, you know, somebody parked their dumpster in the middle of the bike lane at such and such. Oh, somebody, which we've had happen a couple times, which is terrifying. Somebody's put down tax in the bike lane. Mm. Yeah, it's happened at least twice in the past three years where there have been bike lanes um, that people have just put tax down and, and you get a whole bunch of people getting flats. It's just really horrible. But so th there would be a real time aspect so people could report things um, that, that are happening in, in, with bike commuting and, and uh, bike traffic and, and uh, availability and, and uh, construction or obstruction. So this, this was the idea I came up with. And this was somebody um, who, who uh, an employee who was, um, uh, a cyclist themselves, and wanted to work on this app that, that some people were doing. And so they go in, um, and it's, uh, what did we figure out? They, they were, they've just gotten a promotion. Right. So they've gotten, uh, they've gotten a new employment agreement, which can happen sometimes. Like you're, you're changing jobs, or you, you get a promotion. So they hand you the employment agreement, and, and she dutifully goes through it, and she reads it, and she comes upon this, which is the copyright language says, um, that the company will own any and all work, including, but 
not limited to software, manuals, instructional materials, and memoranda created by employee during the course of his or her employment with company shall be considered a work made for hire under the Copyright Act. In the event the work does not qualify as a work made for hire under the Copyright Act, employee hereby permanently and irrevocably assigns the copyright in the work to the company. Which sounds like suck. Until you get down to the invention language, which says employee agrees that all inventions she, he develops a, using company's equipment, supplies, or trade secrets, B, resulting from work she, he performs for company, or C, related to company's current or anticipated research and development, will be company's sole and exclusive property, and hereby assigns all right, title, and interests in same to company. Which is really concerning, right? Because we've got this language that says, uh, during the course of his or her employment. What does that mean? Anybody? I know what I want it to mean. I want it to mean like while I'm in my chair at my desk working at my computer machine. I want it to be only that time. I don't want it to be during lunch. I don't want it to be in the evening. I don't want it to be on the weekend, but that makes it a little bit concerning. Yeah. And then the invention language, as Paula had pointed out earlier, is inherently ambiguous because they want to maybe try to get your stuff if it's really good stuff. If it's bad stuff, they don't need your stuff. Yeah. Um, so if this, were, if this were you, knowing what you have learned to become negotiation gurus, uh, and you had to go in and talk to your boss, what would you do? I have, so I'm a technical writer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it depends on how, how uh, professional I feel like being, sometimes yeah. I say poetry, like yeah. terrible fan fiction, and um, it reads like I'm assigning the rights to that to you, and they go, really? Is that what it says? Yeah. And they invite them to read it, and about mm, three quarters of the time, the hiring manager has not really read this thing yeah. that they're asking you to sign, yeah. and they, they, they ally with you. Which is perfectly acceptable. Yeah. If they'll let you do that and they sign it, aces. Yeah. Um, I just went through, uh, I just got hired on the place and we had to do the whole schedule A where I declared my mm -hmm. significant works. And I'm like, you realize that this is a bit ridiculous for a writer. And yeah. Like, well, yeah, it's really for patents. And I'm like, I know it is. So why do you have the language in there that forces me to declare yeah. other stuff? And they're like, well, <laughs> it, even even if you say that, that really should be an inventions yeah. thing, not not a copyright thing. And and in general, if they do insist upon it, categories, yeah, categories. You know, you know, all all the writing I've done related to blah, all the fiction, right. <laughs> you know, all the poetry, all the various yeah. writings, too many to name. Mm -hmm. Oh, I had none of that. Nah. That's. That's what I had to put on my bar application for parking tickets. Because <laughs> they make you list all of them. Ever. And I couldn't remember. Um, so yeah, one, one thing that you do is go in and make sure that the hiring manager is aware of it. Um, and so the hiring manager might say, eh, the lawyers say we need it. So one of the things you could do is say, OK, I would like to suggest some language. And you could suggest language that, that limits it and says, um, under the direction of the employer or at the employer's direction to limit it that way. The other thing that you could do is talk to that hiring manager. If they say, really, it says that thing? You can say, it does. Would you help me advocate for a change? Because one of the things that often happens is you have the agreement and you have the hiring manager and the hiring manager is like, I love you. I don't want you to go anywhere. So just between you and me is totally fine. The problem is, what if that manager leaves? Yeah. 
and you're still there and you're still doing the thing that they said was okay. So if you get that kind of, if you get that response, which is, hey, I'll totally take care of you. It's totally fine, man. Um, the, be the best response is, um, I trust you and I know that you would take care of me. I want to make sure that whoever comes up after you does the same thing. My, can, can you help me? My favorite example there is, what if you get hit by a bus? <laughs> you know, that's, somebody really did. Yeah. Oh, I, I knew that that was, that I was going to bump into that situation, but I've still never found, you know. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yes. Yes. Is it a question? Mm -hmm. it, is, it is better to have things in writing. It is best to have them in the contract. If you can't get them in the contract and you get some sort of like verbal yada yada, um, one of the things I, I like telling people to do is say thank you in an email that details what you're thanking them for. If, it, if it's verbal, we always get into the he said, she said, which we can get into if it's un, in writing, too. Yeah. But in writing, when it's um, done at the same time, it's a little bit harder to have that argument. Um, so one of the things I, I tell my clients to do, because um, uh, I work with a lot of freelancers who get the, uh, I'll totally take care of you, don't worry about it, sign it anyway, um, is to write an email saying thank you. I really appreciate that you took the time out to talk to me about X, Y, and Z. I appreciate the fact that you are giving me permission to work on this project during these times. Thank you, sincerely, did it. Because what happens is if they disagree with you, they can email you back and then there's that record and you can get down into the heart of it. But if they don't do anything, the record of the conversation is your email. That is, that is my lawyer hack. <laughs> But again, better to actually yeah. get it written in here. It is at the time of signing. So you do this after you've actually signed the contract? Yeah, so uh, the question was it, a lot of times contracts say that th this is our full agreement. Anything that was entered into beforehand is null and void. Um, Prior or contemporaneous. Yeah. So you can. You can ha you can sign that and then later have the conversation um, and do the thank you and that sort of thing. Um, but it all depends on the, the contract language itself. The, the, the language that can get messy is, you know, that, that has amendments must be in writing mm -hmm. signed by both parties. That's, you know, because you want something to show up as an amendment to this. But even so, you've got, at, if you've got it in writing and nobody objected to it, you've got one more piece to argue to say, there's some fancy legal doctrine, mm -hmm. to say, you knew about this and you didn't stop me then, you can't stop me now. Um, it's weaker. You know, each of these positions is progressively yeah. weaker than getting it changed yeah. here. But it's better than nothing. Yeah. It's definitely better than just taking their word for it before they go off and win the lottery. Yeah. <laughs> so appealing to the fact that it's overly broad is one thing you can do. The other thing that you can do is appeal to the fact that the skills that you're going to pick up in this other work it, or the work that you've been doing is actually very helpful to the company. Um, you know, that th this particular project is going to give you the ability to work on something that maybe is bigger or uses a skill set that the employer doesn't want to invest in you learning but would like you to have very much. Um, and so you can say, hey, look, if we agree to this exception, you get all of these things. I think that sounds fair. Um, so that's another way that you can approach it. And I think, I think, I think, is it, we are. We've got 10 minutes. Okay. Oh, cool. Okay. Great. Um, trying to think if there was anything else we wanted to be sure to, to stick in there. Um, you know, think about uh, if, if there is, one of the things that, that a lot of, people certainly in the hiring in the HR uh, area are not going to be aware of is whether there's already open source being used in the company. Um, you know, even, even if they're not, uh, you know, if they're, just, uh, you know, they're layers, if they're distributing it in some form and they don't know it, that's a different problem. Mm. Um, but it, just tools, tools that you're using internally, things that you're using internally in order to create your products or just to run the business. Um, 
there are educational things you can do to help them uh, provide a, 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 you know, put together a policy and enforce the policy. You can become an advocate for that. Um, you know, if, if you bring up the fact that, that they're doing this already and they don't know it, mm -hmm. and wouldn't it be better to get ahead of this issue and not get in trouble later? Um, Are I, you making my incredibly valuable software open source? Is that what you're doing? No. <laughs> no, very much not. And there can be various, and, and obviously we can come up with several reasons why. You know, no, anything that, anything that has gone into the software is under a permissive license. Okay, you know, it's, it's um, you know, that may be one thing. No, I would never do that. These are tools. This is not what's going out the door. These are what we are using to create or you know, which is a little messier these days because of things like the Afero license. No, we're software as a service. We don't distribute anything. People are just using, you know, our software through our site, um, things like that. So there are, there are various ways to, to look at the issues of open source, in particular intersecting with um, companies that aren't familiar, that aren't on top of these. The interesting thing to me is when a company that is all over open source, has some of the same language in their agreements, has things that one that I honestly saw was one that said that any contributions made by the employee had to be made in the name of the employer. And I, I flat out said that's unethical. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that it, it, they can be made you know, if they are connected with the work the person is doing for the company, it should be made by that person as an employee of so-and-so because the companies need to get, I mean, a lot of, if you look at the top 10 Linux contributors, they're, you know, most of them are companies. And of course, it's not the company, it's all the individuals with a, good Lord, Microsoft is one of them, <laughs> you know, Microsoft.com email address, things like that. Um, so the company deserves to get some credit, but it shouldn't have, it shouldn't be the contributor, and certainly not for anything you're doing outside of, of work responsibilities. So, you know, these are things to look for even when you're working for a company that's open source friendly. Yes, sir. Wow. It was pretty exciting. Wow. Okay. Um, uh, we had a question about unenforceable language, whether it covers, you know, before it, language that purported, I will say, yeah. to, to require uh, work done before, during employment, and after. The after thing is, is another question altogether. Um, but uh, you want to handle the, the basic copyright uh, issue of that? Uh. I, you mean in terms of the fact that anything that happens before is already, the, the, so the copyright happened at the time of creation, right? So you can't, you can't do it. The other thing is that if you're assigning it, I, is you, that what you're yeah, talking about? Yeah, because so, it, it, it can't be work for hire right. in that sense because they weren't, you know, you weren't their hand when, when you made it. But they, you can assign it. They can, they can ask you to assign it. A lot of times you'll see assignments say they're, they're permanent and non-revocable, which is sort of a lie. Um, because sometimes you can uh, claw them back, um, but that's Comic where artists, the, yeah. the, all the super band, all those fights, yeah. the, all the DC, yeah, all yeah. Those in fights fact, are about that. Ghostwriter, there was a really cool opinion from the Second Circuit, if you like Ghostwriter, um, just this last week about how Marvel may not own it mm -hmm. yes. okay. because of how that. assignments and work for hire work. So next yeah. time somebody tells you copyright isn't cool, Ghostwriter. Um, <laughs> So yeah, there can be, one with the, the work made for hire, it really has to be, um, because the company is becoming the author, they have to be there at the time of creation. Um, and with an assignment, you, are, you can sell a copyright, right? You can transfer it to somebody else, you can give it to them, so you have to be careful about what it says. But with unenforceable things, it's, it can be really hard at the get-go to be able to identify them on your own. Yeah. Um, which is, yeah. You, you, yeah. It would be something to, to bring in a lawyer or to, to, again, that's something that you can say, this looks wrong. Would you please tell me if you meant that? 
um, and go from there. Now, on inventions, it's almost even, uh, it, it's easier in some ways, but, but more complicated, because you can assign. You know, there's no work made for hire issue there. All of them are, are pretty much assigned to the employer, whether you did them before or after. And they do frequently. One of the reasons you make the list is they say, if you put anything you made previously into one of our products, then you've assigned it to us if you haven't listed it out. Um, so that's, that's one of the reasons you want that list. Mm -hmm. The other thing that these clauses will occasionally have a tail, which means they say anything you invent while you work for us and for the next six months after you leave us, because they're assuming that you can't have an original idea, that it would still be from the company. That, so look, look carefully for that kind of tail mm -hmm. again. Um, because it is, for one thing, it'll cause a huge problem if you're going to work for the next guy. Um, but just in general, those, those need to be very, very strictly constrained. If it really was something that you got, ideas you got from the company, information you got from, you know, if it really, if it really belongs to the company, please be a good, you know, human being about it and, and give it to the company, you know. But, if it wasn't, push back, you know, find a way, you know, and think about these things at the beginning. As we said, it's much easier to do it before anything happens than either getting into the negotiation situation where you're in a position um, of, you know, I've, I've been bad, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've been working on this other thing, um, or having to fight about it yeah. afterwards. contract and I'm going to 99 employee and then like things go stale for like say multiple years but then they're like call you up and say hey do you want to work on some more stuff same company and I go do I need to resign it and they're like no it's still in force so I'm thinking about the gap of the three years in between and what applies in the whole like that okay even though it's not working for hire for them right. but I'm not using any of your equipment yeah but they're totally trying to say like oh you don't have to sign something so then what about gap time um, that's very interesting. So talking about in a 1099 situation, not an employee, but you've, you've got a contract in place. So it's not a work made for hire. And this is, this is something to, to it, 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 it will probably not be a work made for hire. Right. This, the, the language that was up there earlier about everything you do is a work made for hire, right. that will show up in contractor agreements. Right. It's a lie. It's wrong. Work made for hire. Unless you're illustrating something. Yeah. Or making a map map, a test. An encyclopedia. A test. Mm -hmm. uh, good question. That's, that's yeah. kind of because a motion picture, you know, that there are a few, the, 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 the exceptions were lobbied for, you can tell. That they're <laughs> very they're weird. specific. Yeah, making a map. A film strip. Yeah. <laughs> Showing my age. Um, but uh, the, you cannot, the, the only two times you have a work made for hire are those weird things or you are a real live employee. Real live employee for copyright purposes and tax purposes are slightly different, but for the most part they overlap. Okay. Um, so if you're, if you're um, a contractor, independent contractor, the only way they get it is by this assignment language. The other thing you can look at is the term of the agreement, just to make sure that it's still in force. A, a contract will have a term and it will explain how it can expire or how it can be terminated. Um, sometimes uh, non-use is one of those things, but not very often. Um, that's that's another important thing to look at. And and when you do have a situation like that, like where you are, you may be a 1099 employee, but you have a number of different clients that you are working for, it's important that the contracts that you you sign uh, are explicit about um, projects created under this agreement or projects for. Um, you know, company, whomever it is, because that way you protect the stuff that you're doing for your other clients. And usually when you explain that to somebody and say, I'm going to make sure that this provision is in all of the contracts that I sign with other people for your protection, yeah. so I need you to do it yeah. here as well. So the, the statement of work is your friend, even if it's a paragraph that just says, right now we're doing this project and, and that's what I'm doing for you. And then if you have a bunch of those, just a project plan or something. Um, the 
employer wanted to make sure that I had other clients because they didn't want to make sure they want to make sure that I was not solely to them. Yeah. Yeah. Because they didn't want to make me an employee. Yeah. Yeah. It, in, that, that's it's a, yeah, that an is. employment law issue, again, one reason that companies hire so many contractors is that they don't want the unemployment insurance and tax liabilities. Um, and one of the ways that they make sure is you'll see language, there's actually a fun tug of war mm -hmm. between the, the ownership language and the, you're an independent contractor <laughs> and you determine the means and methods of how you, you get this. We only care about your results. But it's ours. Exactly. So those technically, you can't have you know both of those, um, at least not the 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 work, for the work for hire and the arm's length. Um, and in California, they will actually, uh, if you have a work made for hire clause in an agreement, the, the they will say that is an employee and you have to pay a, a, you know a workers comp and stuff. But yeah, one of the ways to show that you're a true independent contractor is that you have multiple different clients, that, that you're working on different things. You're not just 100% um, for one company. But, yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.